Okay. So we are recording now. And again, it should only be recording people who have their cameras on. I'd like to welcome back for another round. What a privilege this is. I mean, you know, getting a, a speaker for, for um, one time can be a challenge, but Howard Scott Warshaw has generously uh, agreed to return. We had limited time with him last time. There were many questions that were still pending. And so very graciously, and in week 10, he has agreed to come back and talk to us one more time. Um, and I'd like to expand on the things we were talking about last time, as well as catch up with some of the questions that we had that were asked that we weren't able to get to uh, last time as well. I have some of my own. But before we get to that, and especially the students in my class know who Howard Scott Warshaw is. We talked a lot about it. We even had a movie night with Game Over where we watched what was a frankly emotional experience of having the Atari cartridges found in the landfill in Alamogordo, New Mexico. And so I will read you the, the um, intro that he sent me. We, we did this last time as well. Howard Scott Warshaw is the most famous person you've never heard of. And as I said last time, that's not true in this class. It may be true everywhere else, but not here. We all know who he is. He's an artist, technologist, creator, and healer. But first and foremost, he is a communicator. Holding, a, holding master's degrees in counseling, psychology, and computer engineering, his career accomplishments include video game pioneer, MoMA artist, that's Museum of Modern Art, celebrated software developer, award-winning film producer, author, educator, and columnist. And in fact, he has a book coming out soon that he'll talk a little bit about. These days, Howard enlists his eclectic skill set in the service of others as a psychotherapist in California's Silicon Valley, where he specializes in the issues of high-tech leaders and the super intelligent. He loves cultivating new skills and finding creative ways to apply them. Howard is a complex person who can be summed up in five words, passion with a balanced perspective. And I think we would all know that to be true, considering his career path, his trajectory, where he started, where he is now, how it all ties together. And these are things we talked about the last time he was here. So before I just get into some of the questions. I also really like the, the fireside nature of it last time. I expected it to be more of a formal presentation, but I really think that that worked out well. It was, it was a very effective thing. Um, Howard, anything you'd like to say to open? I mean, I'd love to meet this guy. He sounds really interesting. <laughs> he is. But uh, no, it's just it's nice to be back, you know, share more. And see what it is. There's a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it's true. I, you know, definitely want people to know about my book coming up called Once Upon Atari, and I'm going to be talking about some of the stories and some of the key points that uh, I cover in the book uh, extensively. Uh, chief among those, I think, and I was talking with Darren about this about uh, some of the cultural aspects of Atari, both what it was like to work there, uh, what the pharmaceutical environment was like to work there which people are usually interested in, and what the real drugs were at Atari. Because there was one drug that was very different from what most people think of as drugs at Atari. And also the, the cultural transition, the difference between a Nolan regime and a Ray Kazar regime was striking. And, uh, and those, those are major themes in the book because I think those are major factors that led to the, uh, the rise and the fall of Atari. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so everybody in this class will know we talked a lot about Nolan Bushnell and his founding of Atari and then bringing in Ray Kassar and the change that took place. And I, I mean, to be fair, Atari had success after Ray came in, but then, then things, they changed. Well, that was always a big question is like, where was the success? Where did it come from? You know, there's, a, there's an old saying that says uh, success has a thousand parents, but failure is an orphan. Mm -hmm. So when there's a great success, everyone wants to take credit. There's no problem finding people to take credit for it. But you don't really find out who knows what's going on uh, until there's an issue. Because uh, another thing, that one of the engineers I used to work with at Atari uh, had an interesting definite. He used to talk about, we talked about state of the art quite a bit. Because at Atari, we were literally working on state of the art. And uh, what he used to say is that the definition of state of the art means that when it's broken, nobody knows how to fix it. That's what, that's what state of the art is about. And I think there was a lot of truth to that. And so 
you know, there's a big debate. So, you know, things got to a certain point with Nolan. And then Nolan wanted to grow the company, but really couldn't, didn't have the resources, couldn't get uh, loans for it. So he sold to Warner. He sold to a deep pockets company who could really leverage and push the company forward. Uh, they bring, I mean, the company was very successful under Nolan. And then they brought in Ray Kazar and things really took off. So there was this question, there was this nagging question, was, was Ray Kazar some kind of business genius and Nolan didn't really know what he was doing and Ray shows up and away we go and like he really you know, created this huge success? Or was it essentially that Nolan had built this rocket, got it all set on the pad, got it all warmed up and ready for launch and then walked away and then Ray walks in and pushes the takeoff button and away we go, okay? And nobody really knew which way that was until we ran into the state of the art test, right? Once things started to go bad in another direction, everybody, you know, at, certainly everybody at Warner looked to Ray Kazar to say, hey, you know, he didn't turn them down for million dollar bonuses when they were appreciating how well it was doing, right? So uh, when it started to turn around and then they said, well, you better fix this, get it going. Uh, he probably wasn't as excited about taking responsibility for it at that point. And obviously, in retrospect, he had no idea what to do right. because it just got worse and worse. And, it's, you know, Atari was the fastest rising company in American business history. And within a few years, they became the fastest falling company in American business history. Right. It's an amazing rise and fall. Mm -hmm. Do you think... I'm not sure how to ask this exactly. Do you think that Ray Kassar knew about the industry? Did he do any research? Did he know what he was getting himself into? Did he think it was just another company? Was he genuinely interested in its success beyond, you know, that it would be his own success? I, I, I've, I've never been sure about that. Uh, I, I don't really think Ray Kassar knew anything about what he was doing at Atari. What Ray Kazar knew, and which is not to say that Ray Kazar was a dummy, because he wasn't. There were, there's an important distinction to make between stupidity and ignorance, okay? And I always think that's a really important distinction to make in, in almost anything you do. And the different, you know, ignorance is a lack of information, right? Stupidity is the inability to use information, right? So, you know, and ignorance can be cured by learning, by research and learning and studying, whereas, you know, there's no cure for stupidity, unfortunately. Although I'm sure the research is ongoing. Yeah. So the thing is, there were a lot of really smart people at Atari who were uninformed or ignorant of what was going on. Ray Kazar wasn't, wasn't a dummy. Ray Kazar was a successful senior executive at one of the largest corporations in the world in Burlington textiles and Warner was a very big corporation entertainment corporation see what, what I thought was interesting about the choice of Ray Kazar it just seemed odd to me because you know entertainment technology wasn't was a new thing nobody really understood it people understood entertainment and people understood technology but entertainment technology, which is what video games were, video games were the hybrid of the tech industry and the entertainment industry. They really hadn't crossed over that much before. There was some tech stuff that was going on in movies, but if you think about it, a lot of the uh, CGI revolution that happened in movies came from the video game industry, and the video game industry and the movie industry were very closely tied for a long time. So, still are. And... What's interesting is that when Warner bought Atari because they thought it's a sexy tech company and, you know, who knows what's going on with it. I, I don't know if they really saw it as an entertainment company. A lot of people looked at Atari as a technology company, but it really was fundamentally an entertainment company. So what's weird about choosing Ray Kazar is Ray Kazar is a very experienced, high-level business executive with no experience in either technology or entertainment. Now, Warner at least was familiar with entertainment, right? They were an entertainment company. They produced movies and media and stuff like that. 
they had some insight into entertainment. And it seemed like they just sort of blew all that off to bring Ray Kazar in, who doesn't know anything about either, but he was a big exec. And sometimes what big execs think is it doesn't matter what the product is, you just need an exec to run the show, and they'll know what to do. And that's the kind of thinking that goes on. And the people from Warner who chose Ray Kazar were the top execs from Warner. These were not people who were on movie lots and you know writing scripts or making entertainment. They were the exec. So they picked an exec to come in and fix up this company. Okay. Unfortunately, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, please. So just unfortunately, you know, they didn't have any idea what they were asking Ray to do. And Ray didn't have any idea what he was, they were asking him to do. But they were paying Ray a lot of money. And when you pay people a lot of money, they assume they know what they're doing. And everybody just assumed that this was all going to be good. And, uh, you know, that's the big story of Atari. You know, it's a bunch of smart people making sensible decisions and walking off a cliff together. Yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, of course, and, and there's also the story of, of Ray Kassar's attitude that caused some developers to walk off and form Activision as well. And, yeah. and so, you know, speaking of, of all of this that you're talking about. Um, one other thing before we continue, I wanted to let, for, for everybody who's here and watching, if you have questions for Howard, please put them into the chat. You can even email them to me or put them in Discord or whatever you want. It's absolutely okay. Uh, if, if there's anything you, you'd like to know, anything from last time, something brand new, then, then please let us know. Um, from last time, though, if, if I may, I... Uh, I was curious, you mentioned that, that you had degrees in econ and you, you did math and even theater and, and then you got into computers and technology. And I remember you saying in our last uh, discussion that you, you found computers really exciting and really interesting and something really new. And I was wondering, back then when computers were what they were, um, what what was your initial, what was your initial um, appeal to them? And what were you, what did you think you would be doing? Or did you have an idea? Or what, where did you see them going? And is that, is that what happened? You mean, what was I doing before I got into computers? Or what did I see as the... What? Where yeah, what, what, what attracted going? you to them? Yeah, and, and what did you hope to do with them when, when, that's, when you started to realize that was going to be the way that you went? Ah, well, computers, it's interesting because uh, I, I avoided computers like the plague. Mm -hmm. In my mind, computers was something that nerds played with, and I didn't see myself as a nerd. I was a top-level nerd, no question. I just didn't, I wasn't ready to self-identify that way yet. And so... Uh, I avoided computers and, and I was in economics. I was going to be, uh, I was going to go to the university of Chicago and study with a guy named Milton Friedman and get a PhD in economics. That was my original plan. But the one thing I really didn't like about economics was because I'm a slow reader. I just read very slowly. And in economics, you have to read all these long books and stuff. Then you have to write all these elaborate papers and stuff. And I enjoy writing now because I, I do creative writing, but, I was not a big fan of writing papers and reading long books and stuff like that. That wasn't the college experience I was looking for. Uh, but that's what I was doing because that's, you know, what I needed to do. I like math because math didn't involve a lot of that, but economics did. And uh, then one day, one of my economics advisors said to me, you know, you're not going to go anywhere in economics unless you have some computer background. Everybody needs computers to move forward. This is in the late 70s. Okay. So, then computers were just coming on. There weren't even computer departments in most schools yet. But uh, people knew this was where things were going. And at first I thought, well, computers, it's kind of cool on a level of like data, because I like data. I just find data interesting. And I thought to myself, if I get involved in computers, I'll, this, is, this is ridiculous, but this is how I thought. <laughs> it's like, I thought, you know, if I get involved with computers, maybe I'll be at the source of a lot of the data and I'll get to see a lot of the data that's going on. And won't that be cool to have access to all this data? That was a way I kind of thought of it. Okay. But when I actually took a course and the way I actually got into it, I go into this whole story in the book because 
It was me. I was like, I came from New York, the New York metropolitan area. I was actually from Jersey. Hmm. And uh, I went to school in New Orleans uh, at Tulane. Tulane? Oh, okay. And uh, there was a guy there who was just an incredible redneck. <laughs> But he was running the chemical engineering department and we were like culturally we were like incredibly different just really weird odd mix but we uh really found a use for each other we each sort of we had a mutually beneficial relationship because on a personal level there really was nothing for us to connect on but i respected him i think he respected me just in terms of our ability and so I went in and, and got in his course and just sort of bombed the course right out and just, it was just amazing. And what I discovered was, oh, this is the college experience I'm looking for. Because with computers, it's like I'm solving puzzles. I don't have to read long books. I don't have to write long papers. I just have to write programs, which is like playing a game and solving a puzzle at the same time. And then if I like, I can write a program to actually play a game. And that's fun. So I just thought, and I can get credit for this. And then it was like, and there's jobs for this. It was like, right. was trying to get a job in economics could figure to be very difficult. The computers were just opening up. So I just thought, wow, this was great. And when I tried it, it turns out I had a real aptitude for it. So I'd spent many years, I mean, because when I was in 10th grade in high school uh, in New Jersey, uh, there's a place that there's a, there's a school called Rutgers in New Jersey, which is like the state university, state university of New Jersey. And we had a terminal, a computer terminal in our high school that was connected to computers at Rutgers. And I had friends, you know, who would get on there and do programming and practice. And so I had the opportunity to get involved with computers uh, from the time I was like 15 when I was in 10th grade. And I didn't. I just totally avoided it. And it wasn't until the middle of my sophomore year that I picked up my first computer course. And uh, about two and a half years later, I had a master's degree in it. <laughs> it, was like, it was just like, oh, this is cool. This is just, it was just exactly what I wanted. And it was great and it was exciting and it was interesting. And I was doing a very unusual kind of programming too. The work that I was doing was real-time control programming system, which was very uh, state-of-the-art and very new back then. I was even writing, you know, people say, you know, I was, I invented the internet. <laughs> it's amazing when people say that stuff. But I actually wrote some software that was called packet switching software that worked on some of the ARPANET, which was the precursor. The internet actually came about from the ARPANET, which was an existing network in the United States, but so all that stuff was very cool to me. I thought it was very interesting and not many, even people who were going to school and it didn't really have that kind of experience. And it was a fun kind of work to do. And then when I got, I got a job at Hewlett Packard out of college and it was like miserable. I was like so depressed because at Hewlett Packard, that's like the software pasture where programmers go to die. It was the way I look at it. And it was, uh, and all the passion and the excitement and the joy that I had found in computing was gone. And that was a very sad time for me. And I started thinking, oh God, what am I gonna do? Because one of the biggest issues I've faced in a lot of my life is boredom. And I don't really tolerate boredom well. Same. And uh, it was really, uh, it was brutal. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I thought computers were the answer and this was so great and I could make a living and everything looked great. And then I got to heal a backer and I finally was working and, and I thought, is this what I'm gonna do? Is this my career now? It's gonna suck. And I didn't like that at all. And I was just sort of morose for a while, as morose as I get. <laughs> and then uh, one of the other people there was, because uh, the thing is I would act out because I'm, I'm kind of a wacky dude. I was way wackier than the kind of people you find at Hewlett Packard. In fact, uh, IBM, when I was originally interviewing uh, around Silicon Valley, they were flying me out for interviews and IBM called me up and they wanted, they wanted to talk to me. And, uh, and I had already accepted a job with Hewlett Packard. I'd already flown out, they did an interview with me and they made me an offer at the end of the day. I just thought that was so cool. 
And so I said, yes, I'll take that because I wanted to go work there. And then I go home back to New Orleans and then IBM calls up and they go, hey, you know, uh, we'd like you to come talk to us. I said, well, it really doesn't make much sense. I've already accepted a job with Hewlett Packard. And this is my first introduction of business ethics in Silicon Valley. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he says to me, well, you haven't started working there yet, have you? I said, well, no. He goes, well, why don't you come talk to us? And my feeling was, you know, word is bond. I made a commitment to Hewlett Packard. I wasn't going to blow that off. And he's like, you, you don't have to do that. You can come here, you can blow them off, whatever. You ought to come try and be out. And I said to him, I said, well, you know, maybe. I said, but, you know, tell you the truth, I don't really think IBM is the place for me. And he goes, why is that? And I said, well, because I think I'm a little more flamboyant than uh, most of the people you have there at IBM. And, and I meant that because, like, I am a pretty wild and crazy individual and was more so then. Right. And uh, he says to me, he goes, oh, he goes, I know what you mean. He goes, but no, he goes, that, it's very different now. It's not like that anymore. I said, yeah. He goes, yeah. He goes, like, like for instance, he goes, a lot of our engineers, they don't even have to wear ties anymore. <laughs> and, I like, right. and I just laughed at him. And he's like, well, what's so funny? I said, I don't think we're talking about the same thing because, you know, not wear a tie, but do they wear pants? Right. It was just it was just so amazing the disconnect. So I did not go to IBM. Mm -hmm. I did go to Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard wasn't really wild enough for me. But I guess you shouldn't really expect Hewlett Packard to be too wild. But but anyway, I would act out. I would just do wacky stuff in addition to my program. And so people would go home and tell Howard stories. Is what they call it. And so one of my. bullpen mates because we used to have not cube but bullpens and uh one of the, my friends in, in there came up to me and goes i was telling my wife a howard story last night and she said oh stuff like that goes on all the time where she works i said where's that where does she work he goes she works at atari and i thought huh well maybe i should talk to Atari." it never occurred to me to go to atari it never even crossed my mind to work at Atari. I didn't think of Atari as a place you work. It's, I knew they made games, right. but I didn't think of it as a place of employment. And But I contacted them, got some interviews. They rejected me. I think I told you about that last time. Yeah. I told you last time about how they rejected me. I'm surprised, ah, though, because story. it seems like you would have fit in, fit in very well with that crew. I did. It's one of one of the real funny things around Atari for years after I got there was the idea that they had rejected me. The idea that somebody thought I wouldn't be a good fit for Atari because I was like the prototypical zoo case at Atari. But, uh, but they didn't know that. But the problem is, because I'm also, I can be a fairly conventional person also. And when I go to interview, I don't go and interview like a madman. Right. And I interview very uh, traditionally or conventionally because I don't want to scare somebody off. And what's so funny is that I pretended to be someone more conservative than who I am to be okay for the interview. And it almost cost me the job because they weren't looking for someone conventional or buttoned down. They needed people who were wacky, wild breakthrough type people because right. this was a brand new medium in a new industry and they needed pioneers and I didn't come across like a pioneer. So it was interesting. Well, it's good that they realized their, uh, their error and that you were able to get in there anyway. And but where, but I mean, your question was, what did I look at? What did, what did I see happening with computers and stuff? Right. And, and that was, I thought computers would be a cool place to be. And then it wasn't, but Atari revitalized my passion with computers. Oh, okay. Great. All right. And actually, two things. One is, you know, speaking of IBM and how and how traditional they used to be, we were talking earlier about companies that start out very creative and then become more managerial. But IBM, in a way, went the other direction. They're 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 much freer now, I think, and open than they were way back when. Would you agree with well, that? Um, kind of. I mean, it's true that they've opened up, but it's IBM is an interesting illusion. Okay, because IBM really is a very conventional and conservative radical technology company, (laughs) if you can. If you can think of it as people who are kind of staid, who wear cardigan sweaters, but do come up with breakthrough concepts and revolutionary technology, 
And IBM's always been that. It's always been kind of a conservative environment. Like for instance, there was, there was I had a friend who worked at IBM. And, uh, and we were talking, he's, and it was a heat wave. It was the middle of summer and there was a horrible heat wave. And so they put out a memo, which is what they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they put out this memo that said, because of the heat, we're only requiring people to wear two of their three-piece suit. You only have to wear two pieces of three-piece suit. So most people would leave the jacket or the vest. He did exactly what I would have done, which is wear a jacket and vest and shorts and not do the pants. You know, that's, uh -huh. yeah. And so he went in that way. And what they did was they made him work the morning and then go home and change during lunch, during his 47 minute lunch. That was another thing IBM was famous for. They had 47 minute lunches and they had this thing where you had an arrival time and a departure time, so that not everyone is pulling into the parking lot at the same time. Huh. They had some revolutionary concepts, but it was super structured. Huh. And, okay. and that's the funny thing about it. IBM does revolutionary technology. They do breakthrough stuff. They've survived a long, long time in a very difficult industry to keep staying on top of, but they have done it in the opposite way of like a lot of creative companies. So right. they're an anomaly in that regard. Okay, yeah, very, very interesting company. And they do do great stuff and continue to. And so then speaking of Atari, I mean, I don't know if I want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I did get a bunch of questions about it last time. Um, they were asking about the, uh, you know, the culture at Atari, not the culture, but the culture, you know what I mean. The drive. They want yeah. to know what do we do day to yeah. day. Yeah, they're asking. Yeah, yeah cuz we I can speak to that. Cuz we could, you know, we we do tell one of the stories in uh in class where apparently Ray Kassar was coming up for the first time and there were people smoking pot in the parking lot and it was just they they just really it was it was just a part of the culture at the time. And, you know, I I'm it not I'm not trying to make was. any statement on it. I'm just curious how that was a part of the culture there. There's no statement that needs to be made about it. It's just the truth. I mean, Pot was a part of the culture at Atari. When I was interviewing, people were sort of feeling me out to say, you know, are you sensitive about marijuana? Is, you know, is, you know, anything you have trouble with or difficulty with? I'm like, only if you don't share it with me. <laughs> that's, that's the only problem I'm going to have with it. But, uh, and, you know, I didn't get stoned all the time. There were, pe there were people who did lots of drugs. There were people who did no drugs. There was everybody in between. You know, the way I like to say it is, you know, uh, no drug was consumed by everyone, and no person did every drug, but every drug was consumed by someone at a time. Okay. There were drugs. Right. But the thing is, there, there was one real drug at a time that was, that was the high that everybody sought. And it, that wasn't about a substance. The real high, the real drug at Atari was getting your game released was taking this thing that you had worked on and slaved on because, you know, it was one person, one game. Right. You know, it was just, you know, we had our own thing. You could do whatever you wanted. You just had to make something that was fun. And if it just sucked, people told you that and didn't release it. Mm -hmm. But if you could get your game to the point where it was fun enough and get it released and then see, you know, it's an amazing feeling to do some work and then see ads for it, to see commercials on TV, to go into a store and see your game there on the shelf, and then the ultimate, the apex trip, right, the max experience at Atari, which I'm proud to say I, I was able to experience a time or two, right. is to go into a store where your game is on the demo system, and to see kids fighting for the controller, to see people actually fighting for the opportunity to play your game, right. there was just something about that that was just, it's an amazing feeling. And that was the real drug at Atari. So most of the other drug utilization at Atari was focused towards arriving at that place. Hmm. Okay. And so speaking of that, how, I mean, you, you've already alluded to it, but how would you describe the feeling of seeing your game advertised on TV and you know, your, your catalog was million sellers. So, and, and, and how, how, not just how does it feel to see your game on the shelf, your game advertised on TV or the radio, but to know that it sold so well was so popular and was so well liked by so many people. 
Well, to be perfectly honest, I mean, to be really honest about it, you know, it's a real, it's a great head trip to see ads on TV for something you did by yourself, something you made, and there it is, and people are going, oh, look how cool this is. Right. That's cool, and it's a great feeling. But by the same token, you have to realize that the, it takes passion. It takes real passion and dedication to produce stuff like that. And when you deal with people who are that passionate or that obsessed with what they're doing, which is the truth of it, mm -hmm. uh, I, when I would see stuff like that, like I would see ads for Yars Revenge, and I would think that's pretty cool. And I would occasionally go to a store just to see is, is Yars up on the screen or are people fighting for it or are people trying to play Raiders. But the truth is, while, I would, while that stuff was going on with Yars, I, my head was completely in Raiders. I was working on Raiders of the Lost Ark. And, and that consumed me. That was, when I'm working on a game like that, when I was working on a game, that was 90, 95% of my consciousness all the time. Right, okay. So there was that. So it, it's fun and it's exciting, but it's, it's almost like a distraction because the real thing is it's the same passion that, that produced that game and now I'm trying to do the next game. And as you see, the other side of it is, as you see more success in a game that you did, it's like, well, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? And was I a one-hit wonder? Was that it? Was that all I have? There's those kind of things kind of creep in and start to uh, nip at your heels. Right. And so I, I was very proud of what I did with Yars, but I didn't really feel uh, solid as a game maker until I was done with Raiders. And I was worried, you know, to see how's that going to go? Because, you know, I've seen people do really good games and then follow them up with a major flop. And believe me, I know what it's like to have people think one of your games is a major flop. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wasn't, but I know what you're saying. So, I mean, in terms of the game itself, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's not hard. I mean, my worst game, my biggest flop, sold a million after a turn. So, right, right. But, they, but they needed it to sell $4 million, so that was unfortunate. One of the things I, I mentioned in my class, and, and I mean, this is, you know, just through my own experience and research is something that I've, I've come to find out. But I guess, you know, it, it might be good to ask you to be sure I'm not misleading my students. I, my understanding is that Atari ordered more cartridges to be developed than there were consoles to play it on in the field at the time. Do you know if that's true? Oh yeah. I've heard that a number of times. I do not believe that's true. Okay. Uh, it's possible. I mean, there's a variation on that theme that people don't say, but what you need is the word active. It is possible that there may have been less than 4 million active consoles. There were way more than 4 million consoles. They were in the 9, 10 million console oh, range, okay. I believe, at the time they got there. But, you know, like with any consumer electronic equipment, like, you know, how many people have video cameras? I guess nowadays most people just use their phone, so your, so your video camera is an active thing. But when people were just buying video cameras, videotape cameras, and, and video capture cameras, it was a big thing to go buy the video camera because, you know, you're going to capture the memories and get the whole family and stuff. And almost invariably, within five months to a year, that thing would just be sitting in the closet and no one touched it. Because the thing people don't realize when they think about stuff like that is when you shoot video, it takes just as long to watch it as it did to shoot it. And who wants to spend that time? We want to be doing the stuff that we should be taking video of. We don't want to be reviewing what we did that much. Right. So it's, uh, and that's the thing. And the, the VCS was the same thing. You know, people were tiring of it. People were playing it less. People were doing other things. Some people had gotten it in Intellivision or a Coleco, which was a nicer capability system, and their 2600 might have been sitting in the closet. But it was not, it was, it is not true that there were only 2 million VCSs distributed and they made 4 million carts. That just, that, I've heard that in a number of places. It's just not true. Okay, good to know. I don't have it on my slide, but I think I do say that in one of my, one of my lectures, so I'm glad to get that, get that cleared up. Um, and I, we, we do have some some questions uh, here in the chat that I also wanted to get to, and some from last time. But I also wanted to mention very quickly, uh, speaking of Yars Revenge and speaking of Raiders of the Lost Ark, first of all, Yars Revenge, when the explosion happened, my understanding is that's that's a, it's a representation of the actual code that's being placed that's on the correct. screen. Is that right? 
Yeah, the explosion and the ion zone. In fact, I right. had a whole big thing. I have a whole chapter on this in the uh, in my book. Oh, okay. They, I had to go through uh, legal. I had an argument with legal because when people found out, I let some people know that that's kind of what was there, and they said, "Oh my God, this is the the, the trademark infringement. You can't put your code on the screen." And people, they were saying people are going to actually look at the screen, figure out the code from what was going on there, okay. and it took me. A, quite a while and a lot of hours of lectures, some whiteboard stuff and a few hand puppets to really explain to them how no one is really going to credibly be able to derive the code from what I put on the screen. It's just I used it for the graphics, which was kind of a cool technique to use and it saved me having to waste more space on graphics so I could put more gameplay on. Yeah, I just thought that was fantastic when I heard that. So. Um, for those of you who didn't catch that, Yar's Revenge, the game, we talked a lot about that and, and where the name came from and all that. When the explosions happen and in the, in the zone in the middle of the screen, that's actually a representation of the actual code. We talked about that a little bit in class, if you remember that. So really, uh, really a clever use of that. And also, I assume when, when you were developing games at Atari, how were they play tested? Did you play them? Uh, did you hand them out to friends and family? Did colleagues play? How did that work? Uh, we would bring friends in sometimes. That was a big treat for people to be able to come into right. Atari and play games and stuff. Okay. That was fun. That was always good for lots of favors. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> right, right. If you wanted to collect favors from people, you say, hey, I'll bring you in. You know, you can play, play test the game. Okay. Uh, what do you do for me? Yeah. So, uh, initially, it was the engineers decided when a game was good. Or not. I mean, we, we were always playing each other's games. And labs were sort of like these open rooms where the systems were around the perimeter of the room. So anybody, and all facing into the room, so anybody standing in the room and working in the room can see all everybody else's screens. And you take a break from your game, you go play other people's games and give them feedback. Okay. There was a lot of interactivity that way. And it was up to the engineers you know, as a whole, basically, when they felt a game was, was decent and ready to go. Uh, over time, and we were basically responsible for debugging, you know, ourselves and, and doing that. Then uh, it wasn't that long after, before they came up with a uh, testing to play, started to have actual testers. And that grew into a whole testing department. And that became the testing and library and archive department. So there was this group of people who you would give, and they would burn EEPROMs for us. They would burn, uh, you know, versions of the game that you could play on other systems and or on other units so you can't just you don't have to just play it on the development system and they would test the game and play through the games and you had to get 40 hours of bug free uh, experience on a game before it could be released once they had that going and then there was the library and most of us used to have these huge collections of um, it mid development versions of games and I just threw a lot of those out because that was all garbage for a long time. I realized what a gold mine I threw out because yeah. I, I could put those on eBay now. It would be so great. But uh, it's just, you know, it was a testing department. And then after a while, the tech, because the testing department also would give play feedback. And then after a while, they literally just became a QA department because the idea of feedback uh, started to wane and that goes into the cultural transition. It's another major theme of, of this book okay. Right is the idea that it used to be The way I put it is there's two kinds of people in business, right? There's people who make things and there's people who make money from people who make things That's basically the two kinds of people you run into in business So most people got to figure out are you going to be a person who makes things? Or are you going to be a person who makes money from people who makes things? And there's no judgment there, right? These are both valid things, and you need all of them to make things work. Because making money from people who make things is an important part of paying the salaries of the people who make things. And so, you know, it's a very symbiotic relationship in a lot of ways, but it's a very different philosophical orientation. And so, what one way to look at the transition from Nolan Bushnell to Ray Kazar is that Nolan Bushnell was a CEO, but he was a person who makes things. He was a person who actually created things, built games, put it together. He was an engineer himself. He would, and when he ran the company, the company's main theme was about, you know, it was, it was people who make things. When Ray Kazar came in, Ray Kazar was never a person who makes things. Ray Kazar was totally a person who makes money from people who make things. 
And he brought in a whole regime of people who were all people who make money from people who make things. And what happened was you went from a culture that was very deeply connected with the product to a culture that was totally disconnected from the product. They were very connected to marketing channels and Kmart outlets, you know, and sales reps and things like that. But they really didn't know anything about the product, you know, because anybody who really knew something about the product would never have allowed a circumstance to come about where the most expensive license you ever got in the history of your business was given the shortest schedule of any product you ever attempted by a factor of five or more, right? That's just, that's an absurd business decision to make. We're going to make a huge investment. And what we're going to do is we're going to make this huge investment in something that we can't possibly make successful. What do you think about that? Hmm. You know, if you put something like that before the board, they should, should fire the person who's proposing right <laughs> because it's just a stupid thing to do but the reason they did they're not stupid people but remember what i said at the beginning right the difference between ignorance and stupidity they were literally ignorant of the development process they had no idea how hard it might be to do a game in five weeks from their point of view you ask development for something and you get it and if they say it's difficult you you give them you propose a bonus. <laughs> that's, oh, right. yeah. that's what you do to motivate people. But it, the idea of asking for, a, the idea of it being absurd to ask for a game with five weeks just, just didn't occur to them. It wasn't part of their, their cognitive process in any way. So, and that's what I mean by ignorance. They just, they literally didn't know any better. Now, what's unfortunate and another signal of the pathology in Atari, in my opinion, is that they it never occurred to them to even check in. You know, they I think they spent more time negotiating this license than they left for the development. Mm -hmm. So if they would have spent half the time in negotiation that they did, if they would have accelerated the negotiation, they could have almost doubled the development time for the game and way increased the possibility of having a more successful game. Right. So, but they didn't know, they didn't, they don't think like that, but it never occurred to them to say, even to go over to somebody who's like a vice president in engineering and say, Hey, you know, we're negotiating this deal. How, how long do you think it would take to make a game like that? Hmm. You know, what does it take to do something like that? They never asked. They never had any idea. Nobody in development heard anything about this until the morning they finished negotiating the deal. And then that morning they called my grand boss you know, who was the director of development for all the BCS stuff, their 2600, and said, hey, you know, we've got the deal for the ET. We need the game for September 1st. This is July 27th. He says, you know, it's like five weeks and a half dead. And he goes, we need the for September 1st. You know, what do you think? And he said, no, you can't do it. He just, he just flat rejected it. He just said, no, you can't do a game in five weeks. It just doesn't happen. But for some reason... Ray Kazar, the CEO, after he heard that from my boss's boss, called me directly. I didn't know he had just talked to my boss's boss, or it might have influenced my thinking. Right. But uh, he just called me up, like, out of the blue, and like, hey, Howard, you know, we need ET for September 1st. Can you do it? And I just instantly said, absolutely, I can do it, as long as we reach the right agreement. Right, yeah. And I, I saw your uh, commentary on that on one of the one of the shows where you you were you were happy about the challenge from what i understood i love the opportunity yeah i wasn't personally betting millions and millions of dollars on the outcome that's right and so that's that's a good answer because actually in our in our previous uh discussion we had two questions about that as to whether or not atari really thought that something of quality could be created in five weeks um but well you know, and the answer is yes they did. Well, it, there's, there's two sides to that answer. One is they felt they could put something, the executives, right? They felt they could put something out in that time frame because they didn't know what it meant to put something out. But when you say put something out of quality, there is a, there is a significant question as to how much quality figured into um, their thinking, the executives under the Ray regime. Because I don't think product quality had meaning for them. They determined product quality by sales. That was the exclusive metric 
for product quality. And so they put together this formula where you get a license and it's a pre-sold market. And as long as you can get something out while that market is hot enough to generate pre-sales, who cares? Because they'll forget it and move on to the next product after this. So it was just a way of harvesting money. And this is what I mean about, and it's a viable strategy. I mean, it makes sense. It's not a ridiculous idea. But the thing is, it's like, just like engineers who lose touch with the idea that at some point we have to sell something to generate money, there's engineers like that and they don't do that well. And there are executives who think, who cares what the product is? We just need to get people to buy it and it doesn't matter if they're dissatisfied afterwards, we got their money. Right. But we don't get their next dollars is the problem. Right. And uh, that's the thing. That's the difference between you know people who make things and people who make money from people who make things. Yeah. So um, more questions in the, in the chat. Um, if you, so I, I'd actually like to um, rephrase this. I think it's an interesting question, especially considering what you do now. Um, uh, if you have kids or if you don't, but you did, you know what I mean? If you do, or are there, are there games that you would want them to play or games that you would not want them to play? Games that you see now, would you, would you restrict them? Uh, in any way with what's out there now or would it, you know, would it depend on their age or what do you think? Um, I think, you know, with kids, you have to be careful about theming in the games to some degree. And theming is another thing that I discuss and in, in it's like, it's kind of a funny idea what, you know, the difference between a game itself and the theming of a game. And I think we talked last time some about Grand Theft Auto. Right. right. You know, I thought that's a good, and there's the classic example of a great game with horrific theming. Right, so I would want my kids to play a game that has the design, innovation, and quality of Grand Theft Auto, but I'd be concerned about the theme. But as the kids got older, I would be able to talk with them and say, forget about the theming, that's just stupid, but look at what they did here. Look at, look at how this game was put together. Look at the, the, the quality of the principles and the, and the uh, innovation that's going on in this game. So the kind of games that I would want my kids to play uh, I, are games that I think stimulate uh, cognitive development, right? I would want games that keep you thinking, where you're trying to solve something, you're trying to figure something out. Mm -hmm. Pattern matching games aren't too bad for that kind of thing also, they're stimulating. I would, I would want them to avoid what I call scripted games. Uh, the quintessential example of that is Pac-Man. I don't know how familiar you all are with Pac-Man. Oh, they're familiar with Pac-Man, Pac all right, yeah. They know Pac-Man, so, yeah. So Pac-Man is a pattern game, and I'm not knocking it per se, right? I mean, Pac-Man is just, but there's, to, to play Pac-Man really well, you need to know the script. You need to know how to go, and it, the challenge is not to dynamically beat the game. The challenge is like to read a script perfectly. Mm -hmm. It's like an acting challenge, right? Whereas a game like Defender or Robotron, there you are in a dynamic re, a read and react mode all the time which I think cognitively and intellectually is more stimulating. Mm -hmm. uh, but some people really like the uh, affinity and the surety of knowing that if I, I know what to do and if I just do it right, I win. That's a thing that doesn't always happen in life. And so it's really nice to find a place where that can happen to know if I'm, because in life I can do everything exactly right and still come out like really with a problem. And that can be very frustrating. Some people do not like that experience. So there's a place for both types of games. But if, for, as far as my kids are concerned, I would direct my kids towards games that are not scripted-based games, but are games that uh, require uh, dynamic thinking or uh, recognition, uh, pattern recognition, things like that. Like, I'm a big fan now of uh, Candy Crush. It's, like, disgusting. But uh, I just... I just really enjoy that game. Okay, and and actually, in in the in the uh, last discussion, there was a question about your thoughts on mobile gaming. But but before before that, um, and actually, one thing I was going to say about Raiders of the Lost Ark is that I don't I don't know if you if you played it recently, but I used to be a lot better at that game. I could just I could navigate my way through it right to the end. And I don't know. You get older, and I, I guess you just can't do it like you used to be able to. So. 
There's a lot of things like that. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, that's true. That's right. Yeah. Um, so there's there's actually two questions here that I I think are good, and they're they're relating back to Atari again. Um, one is at the time, and this this is a question that came up in our previous discussion as well. I don't think we had time to get to it. Um, back then, did you notice any signs that foreshadowed the crash? I mean, you mentioned that you you could see that something was coming. You saw something looming on the horizon. And and the other question, I, I don't like the double barrel questions like this, but you know, since your games were always very high selling, did you feel pressure? I know you felt pressure with yourself, but did you feel pressure from others or from Atari itself to keep making games that sold extremely well? So there's really two questions. Did you notice signs that foreshadowed the crash? And what was, even as that was happening, what was the pressure to continue to perform? Yeah, that's cool. I'm seeing them in the feed. Uh, Neil's question is a good one. Uh, I did not really feel a tremendous amount of pressure from other people because of the pressure I put on myself. I think I didn't so much face pressure from other people as I felt expectations from other people. As I started to produce games that were working, I noticed that people were sort of like, well, let's put Howard on that because we need that to, to really be a winner. And so it wasn't like pressure I was feeling from them, but I felt their expectation. And that, motive, that, that increased the amount of pressure I put on myself because I wanted to fulfill uh, that expectation, which is a character flaw of mine. <laughs> so it's, uh, but I don't, people weren't like, geez, Howard, you gotta make this work. This has gotta happen. Oh my God, what are we gonna do? It, I was never facing stuff like that. And uh, to uh, Krista's point, there was a lot of, I mean, in retrospect, and in the book, I analyze a lot of, you know, here's wh the way this was going, and here's, you, you could see this coming, and these were obvious signs of what was happening. But, you know, denial is a very powerful force. And when, when everything is going really well for me, I am disinclined to really spot problems that are coming because the last thing in the world I want is for anything to rain on my parade. And so in engineering, there were things, we could see things happening. The scale of parties that they used to throw started to suddenly diminish and get simpler and skimpier and, and less involved. And that was a sign. There was less visits by some people. There was less trips that were taken. Uh, there was more concern about deadlines and uh, and uh, meeting schedules, you know, became paramount. And like, hey, aren't you guys doing enough? How come we're not seeing more stuff? How come we're not seeing more games? There was, we never heard stuff like that originally. It was just about, boy, have you heard how well this is selling? So there were signs, but we were, we were absolutely uninterested I mean, certainly I was pretty uninterested in really seeing a downside mm -hmm. in spotting it. I was willfully blind, okay. and I think a lot of us were. Okay. Um, that, that question, I think that uh, speaks to that. And from the, from the last, uh, a question came up in the last uh, discussion, and this is a topic that I wish I had more time this quarter to get to, but... Um, especially because your games are so well known and because of your time at Atari. Um, do you have any thoughts or, or concerns, I suppose, or opinions on um, the use of emulators? I don't think we got to that last time, did we? Uh, we might have brushed on it. Okay. I'm good with it. I mean, there's nice people a chance to experience stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've played some emulators. It's, it's not a perfect uh, replication, but it's pretty close. And depending on the game, some games are virtually exact. Some games are, are not exactly there. Even though you can be running the actual code from the original game on an emulator, sometimes because of the way they tweak the graphics and stuff, it, it shifts it a little. But, you know, it's, it's getting the experience of playing the games the way they were. And uh, I think that has tremendous value. It has tremendous value for people who can play the kinds of games that you can play today. It's interesting, I think, to get a sense of what playing a game was like then. And it's like cyberpunk is coming out this week, right? 
Oh, the class you know, has been talking about that endlessly. Yes, I know. I had to set up a right. special channel just for cyberpunk. Yeah. So the thing I think to notice is that, you know, think of how excited, you know, a lot of people are to get a hold of cyberpunk and mm -hmm. to play that now. Right. And to realize that these games you're playing on the emulators, there was a time where people were that excited for this. Right. <laughs> This was the thing that they were couldn't wait for, that this was the big thing. This was like, oh, my God. And now, because now you look at it through the eyes of someone who knows where games have gone, you could go, boy, you know, that that's not as much of a game. It's not that it's horrible or it's a bad game or unenjoyable, but right. it's much less sophisticated and much less involved and much less engaging, in my opinion. And, uh, but... Those games back then generated exactly the same kind of enthusiasm and excitement that Cyberpunk is generating this week. And I think when you look at stuff through an emulator, that's a very important lens to bring to it. I agree. And, and uh, you know, they, they have assignments in, in this class where they have to play through a couple of them. And, uh, you know, it, it's, I always find it fascinating, fascinating the 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 variety of games that were able to be created on something like the VCS and the variety of experiences that were able to be created, uh, considering you well generally you had a joystick and a and a button and that was it. Raiders actually used two joysticks, uh, but there were also the driving controllers and some others. But there was such a wide range and uh, and you know you couldn't you know now there, we've had the graphics versus gameplay argument for years and years and years now, but back then it was. It wasn't so much, you know, that it's that the game had to rely on gameplay. You had to give them something that was that was compelling and something that they wanted to experience. And something fresh. That was the cool thing. Unfortunately, I am turning into a pumpkin once again. So I'm. Gonna I know. I know you have down. a cutoff. So, okay. Well, in that case, we will we will wrap it up again. Thank you very much. I can't I can't say thanks enough. For, uh, for your second time around. I'm very grateful for that. And, uh, oh, it's my pleasure. I enjoyed talking with all of you. And uh, if you enjoyed what you heard here, you will really enjoy my book. I guarantee you. So Once Upon Atari, How I Made History by Killing an Industry. <laughs> it's, uh, it should be available in paperback by the end of next week and also on eBooks. But I'm, I'm going to send a link to Darren who can send it out to any of you. So if you're interested in getting the book, It'll be on Amazon next week. Oh, I'll absolutely. Okay, yeah, I will absolutely be doing that. Okay. So thanks again. It, it's been a real privilege. Thank you for sharing your insight and your experience with us. It's been fantastic. A great way to wrap up the quarter, really. My pleasure. I enjoyed it very much. Thank all of okay, you. Okay, thank you. I'll be in touch. Take care, Darren. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.